Hello, I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's lecture. I'm Jeff Sayer McCord. I'm the director of the Philosophy, Politics, and Economics program here at UNC. If you don't know about it, or even if you do know about it, I'm going to tell you briefly what it is. It's an undergraduate minor here at UNC. It involves taking five courses, a gateway seminar, which brings the three named disciplines together, philosophy, politics, and economics. Then one course from each of the three areas, then a capstone seminar using cutting edge research with each student also doing an end of career at UNC research project that brings PPE to bear on whatever is of interest to them. Whether it's English literature or biochemistry or pre-med, that final project approaches those topics and brings PPE to them. As much as I believe of the PPE minor that it's an enrichment for every single student who does it, I think kind of the best part of the whole program are all the extracurricular activities, like this lecture, like our weekend seminars. We recently had one on poverty where we brought together co-authors of a consensus report on poverty from the American Enterprise Institute and the Brookings Institute and then brought in a Duke professor who's a sociologist economist and they talked about income poverty, wealth poverty, spend a day basically teaching people how to think fruitfully about poverty, what things we might do to begin addressing it. Uh, we also hold reading groups that meet for eight weeks each semester. Each group is dedicated to a book, so students spend the semester with a book over a nice dinner in the back room of a local restaurant, just talking with other interested, smart people who've read the same book. Okay, that's enough about PPE program. I want to introduce our speaker. I first met Robert Paul Wolf in 1977, 42 years ago. Now, he won't remember. The reason he won't remember is not the reason he's probably guessing right now. The reason he won't remember is because we didn't meet in person. I met the person, Robert Paul Wolf, in this exact book. Kant's Theory of Mental Activity. This was a book used at my college in a course on Kant that I didn't take. <laughs> but my then girlfriend, now wife, was in that course. In the beginning of this book, in the, in the preface, are a description of two things. First, the course that Professor Wolf took with C.I. Lewis on Kant as an undergraduate at Harvard. In that course, he was required, the whole class was required, to write a summary of the reading each and every week. The course my wife took using this book and the critique was modeled on exactly that. Every week, I did the reading. Every week, I argued with my girlfriend, the relationship survived this process, about Kant, about Wolf's interpretation of Kant. Every week she had to write a short paper, I didn't. It's a good arrangement. I came out of college having had a very serious engagement with Kant's critique, thanks to that course which I didn't take, thanks to this book, which I read very carefully. The other thing in the preface that I love is a description of a part of how Professor Wolf was a graduate student. He describes that as a graduate student, he and four other classmates met weekly, four hours every Wednesday in the evening, to read and argue about the critique. And he describes this book as having been written with those classmates in mind, each of whom spent a lot of the rest of their career thinking about Kant. This shaped my way of being a graduate student very much. 
I got the idea that what you should be doing as a graduate student is wrestling seriously with your smart peers to try to understand some of the most important ideas there are in the universe. It was a wonderful model for me, but the real model of this book was every page you got a person beautifully introduced to me, wrestling with trying to put in a clear, understandable way the heart of the arguments he found in the critique and found so initially puzzling. So it's really my pleasure to introduce my acquaintance, my teacher of 42 years ago, a person whose work I've read much of, though not nearly all of it, including some of his work on Rawls. Uh, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Robert Paul Wolf to talk about a game theoretic analysis and critique of John Rawls's A Theory of Justice. Thank you, young Jeff. <laughs> I've reached the point where my students are retired. It's an interesting experience. I'm not retiring. <laughs> I, John Rawls's A Theory of Justice is widely viewed in the Anglo-American world as the most important piece of moral and political philosophy of the last hundred years. So I'm going to assume that all of you have some acquaintance with it either directly or indirectly. If you don't, this is a good time to practice the most important skill you can ever have as a student, which is faking it. <laughs> Before I begin, I need to explain how I see the book. And to do that, I need to borrow a technical term from the, from the field of cinema, or as we used to call it when I was young, the movies. The term is fat suit. A fat suit is an all over costume and makeup that transforms a slender actor into a fat character. If you want a good example, you can look at The Nutty Professor, a 1996 Eddie Murphy movie in which he plays Sherman Klump. Eddie Murphy, as you, I'm sure you know, is a slender, tall actor. In the movie, he plays Sherman Klump, who is enormously fat. He also plays Sherman Klump's mother and father, who are enormously fat. Eddie Murphy is wearing a fat suit to transform him into Sherman Klump. A theory of justice is, in my view, a slender, tautly argued monograph in bargaining theory, wearing a philosophical fat suit. I don't intend to talk about all of that costume and makeup. I intend to talk only about what I see as the central argument. Now, before I start on the book, I need to put you in the picture, which means telling you the state of play in Anglo-American moral philosophy in the middle of the 20th century, when Rawls was just starting out. There had, for 50 years or more, been an ongoing fight between two schools of thought, utilitarianism and intuitionism. Utilitarianism was traceable back to the late 18th century writings of Jeremy Bentham. Intuitionism was traceable back to the late 18th century writings of Immanuel Kant. Over time, both of these schools of thought had adjusted themselves in order to meet opposition and criticism from the other. So, old-fashioned utilitarianism gave way to ideal utilitarianism and then to rule utilitarianism rather than act utilitarianism. In the intuitionist school, when it became clear that you could not actually defend Kant's claim that the fundamental principle of morality could be proved by an a priori argument, the intuitionists retreated to their moral intuitions. And when that created problems for them, they invented the notion of prima facie duties. This struggle had gone on for a long time when Rawls came on the scene. And it was Rawls's desire to find some way of capturing what he thought was best about each of them 
in a single position. And he had an idea. I think it's fair to say that it was a brilliant idea. His idea was this. He would start out by reaching back to a tradition that was actually older than either utilitarianism or intuitionism, the tradition of the, of the social contract in political philosophy, which had its roots in late 17th century writings. And he would then join that to a hyper-modern field of mathematics that had just recently been created by the great Hungarian-American theorist John von Neumann, the field of game theory. And by putting these two together in a form that had come to be known as bargaining theory, Rawls thought he could establish a fundamental proposition which lay at the heart of all moral and political philosophy. Rawls stated the first version of his view in, a, in an article called Justice as Fairness. It appeared in the Journal of Philosophy in 1958, and then a somewhat revised version appeared in this book, uh, a book called Philosophy, Politics, and Society, which was a collection of essays done by Peter Laslett and W.G. Runciman. It actually appeared in the second series. Run Laslett and Runciman ended up doing four volumes, I think. And Justice as Fairness appeared in the second of them. Let me start by reading for you. The, well, Rawls enunciated two principles. Two principles which he claimed were the solution to a bargaining game. The bargaining game went like this. As in social contract theory, Rawls imagined a group of people in a society, an ongoing society, which come, who come together once and for all to decide upon the principles that will regulate and govern their interactions with one another. Now, Rawls posited, as social contract theory did, or at least some versions of it did, that these individuals would be rationally self-interested agents. They were looking out for themselves, and they were rational. Rational here meant, first, that they knew what they wanted, that their desires were consistent with themselves. If they desired A to B and B to C, they would desire A over C, not C over A. And they were rational. That is to say, they weren't foolish, they weren't stupid, they weren't bad reasoners, they were fully rational. Rawls added to this assumption, which was the classic assumption of social contract theory, two further posits. The first was that once these individuals had come to an agreement, if they could come to an agreement, on the principles to regulate their society, they would commit to it forever. Now that's not a rationally self-interested thing to do, purely and strictly. The, rational sense, the rationally self-interested thing to do is to commit to the principles that you think will advance your own interests, and then later on, if it turns out that those principles are not helping you, you break your word. That's the rationally self-interested thing to do. But Rawls assumed that he would take them one step beyond rational self-interest, not to any substantive assumption that they all shared, but simply to this procedural agreement that once they had arrived at an agreement, if they could, then they would commit to it. And he conceived this in the form of a bargaining game, as this came to be called in game theory. The second assumption was a very odd ad hoc assumption. I'll explain the reason for it in a few minutes. He assumed that they were not envious. But then? Why shouldn't they be envious? They're rationally self-interested. Why shouldn't they be envious? Well, it turns out that if they're envious, that screws up the argument. So he assumed that they weren't envious. For those of you who know something about this, it made it possible for him to introduce the notion of Pareto optimality. That's, that's just a way of dropping a term to show you that I know about this stuff. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain it later. 
And with that in mind, Rawls then enunciated the two principles which he thought would be the solution of this bargaining game. And I'm going to read you from Justice as Fairness the first statement that appeared in print of these two principles. The conception of justice which I want to develop may be stated in the form of two principles as follows, says Rawls. First, each person participating in a practice or affected by it has an equal right to the most extensive liberty compatible with a like liberty for all. And second, inequalities are arbitrary unless it is reasonable to expect that they will work out for everyone's advantage. And provided the positions and offices to which they attach or from which they may be gained are open to all. Okay, that was, that was the statement of the two principles. Now, let me just read to you uh, from a little bit later on, a few pages further in the same essay, the point at which Rawls introduces the non-envy assumption. He introduces it, as is his want, very guilefully. He says, the bare knowledge or perception of the differences between their condition and that of others is not within certain limits and in itself a source of great satisfaction. He talks about, he talks as though he's giving you his understanding of the way people are instead of making an assumption in an argument. That's his way of writing. Only the last point adds anything to the usual definition of rationality. This definition should allow, I think, for the idea that a rational man would not be greatly downcast from knowing or seeing that others are in a better position than himself unless he thought their being so was the result of injustice or the consequence of letting chance work itself out for no useful common purpose, and so on. So if these pe persons strike us as unpleasantly egoistic, they are at least free in some degree from the fault of envy. That's just, well, there's, there's a great line in the Gilbert and Sullivan comic opera, The Mikado, where Poobah is explaining to the Mikado that a lie that he told was just, he said, how, sh how does it go? Just a, just a, a bit of, just a bit of, of persiflage to add an air of, of plausibility to an otherwise bald and unconvincing narrative. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's roughly what Rawls is doing. Instead of saying, I assume that they are non-envious because the math doesn't work if they're envious, he writes as though he's f speaking with great wisdom about the nature of human beings. Not a bit of it. All right. Having said this, Rawls now stakes out a claim. If you've read a theory of justice, I will come to this in a second, but if you've read a theory of justice, you may think that, well, he gave that up. Turns out he didn't. But here's the claim, and it is, the, it is my, in my view, the secret to the entire, to all of the work that he is doing. Rawls says, the argument should be taken as a proof or a sketch of a proof for the proposition I seek to establish is a necessary one. That is, it is intended as a theorem, namely, that when mutually self-interested and rational persons confront one another in typical circumstances of justice, and when they are required by a procedure expressing the constraints of having a morality to jointly acknowledge principles by which their claims on the design of their common practice are to be judged, they will settle on these two principles as restrictions governing the assignment of rights and duties and so forth. This is a theorem. And I'm going to take Rawls seriously when he says it's a theorem because that's, I think, what makes his philosophy interesting. Now, if you've ever picked up a theory of justice, which is itself an effort, <laughs> it is an enormous book. It runs to some 500 pages, and I think there are about a thousand words on every page, or at least it feels that way when you read it. Okay. This, is, this lecture is going to appear on YouTube and will be available long after I'm dead, but I can't stop myself from telling stories, so I will tell a, a brief story. When the book appeared in 1971, the publisher sent me a copy. 
And since I figured that I was a political philosopher, I thought I ought to read it. But it's very big, so I thought I'll put it by my side of the bed and I'll read a little of it every night. And I did. And I got through about 130 pages and I just couldn't go on. It was so boring. So I put it aside. And then about a year later, I thought, this will never do. I mean, damn it, I've got to read this book. It's the most important thing written in political philosophy in the last 100 years. So I started again, and this time I got through about 160 pages, and I gave out. So then I figured, all right, that's enough of that nonsense. So I assigned it in a course. <laughs> I figured, if I assign it in a course, I have to read it, right? And I made it all the way through, once. Once was enough. <laughs> Rawls's work is brilliant, but I must say the elaborations, which people obsess about, strike me as being nothing more than a philosophical fat suit. Now, that's the theorem. You, you heard the two principles, the circumstances of justice. The theorem is that when people come together in this way in what he calls the circumstances of justice, the circumstances of justice just means, for example, that they aren't what's called, uh, what's the term in biology when one, one sex is so much bigger than the other. Walruses are like this. Sexual dimorphism. Hmm? Dimorphism. Dimorphism, thank you. The, the, assuming that they're not dimorphic and assuming that some of them aren't, you know, world wide world of wrestling wrestlers and the others aren't jockeys that is that they're roughly equal power and so forth there is some impulse for them to get together and argue those are the circumstances of justice and Rawls's claim is that they would arrive as that it is a theorem in bargaining theory that they would arrive at these two principles that's an extremely exciting and strong claim and if it were true, it would be absolutely game-changing. Now, as it happens, it's not true. Not in the form in which Rawls first stated the two principles. Because Why? Because it's not a theorem. That is to say, the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises. Why not? There are two reasons, one of which Rawls was very much aware of and which led to the, a fundamental change in the theory, the other of which he wasn't exactly so aware of, but at least I never got the impression that he was, but he might have been in some form. The first problem is this. They, all these rationally self-interested agents get together. Now, they are rationally self-interested, but they have varying degrees of intelligence and skill and aptitude, and they know it because they are fully aware of who the other people are. So when somebody proposes this idea of inequality is justified only if it works to everybody's advantage. Inequality here means you get more pay. That's what inequality means. The ones who are talented and know that they're bright think that's a great idea, because they figure I'll end up at the top. The ones who know that they're dummies, but not so dumb that they aren't rationally self-interested, say to themselves, wait a minute, that's not such a good deal. How about the following? We set a reasonably, a, a, a reasonably low uh, level below which you don't get the top jobs. And if you're above that, the top jobs are handed out randomly. Now, if people like me get one of the top jobs, since I'm not one of the really able people, the total output of the practice will be lower. And therefore, everybody will be worse off than they would with him over there or her over there getting the top jobs. But I'll be better off because I have not a shot at the top jobs the way things are set up. But I have a shot at them if they're handed out randomly. So they can't come to an agreement. So it's not a theorem. The other reason it's not a theorem is kind of quirky and weird. But the, the, in, the exciting thing about game theory, like all of mathematics, is that on the one hand, it's tremendously powerful, and when you prove a theorem, it, it sticks forever. On the other hand, any objection, no matter how weird, that undermines the argument counts. Now, they all get together. How do they debate? Well, let's say, for example, they all sit in a big circle where each one can see all of the others. 
and they say, okay, we'll go around the circle and each person will propose a set of principles. And we'll keep going till everybody, to, to, till we do one complete circle with everybody proposing the same principle. Then we've all agreed and we're good to go. So the first person says, I have red hair and I think that we ought to adopt the principle that red-haired people get everything. Why not? You might as well give it a shot. No, nobody else agrees to that. So you go around and people are proposing self-interested proposals. After a while they say, this is not working, we've got to put a limit on how much time we've got. So they put a limit of four hours. That's how long it takes to go around the circle once. Exactly four hours before they have agreed to stop debating, the person who looks out and gets the, to, sit, to propose a principle looks around and says, if I propose a principle that's so self-interested, nobody else will agree to it, then we all lose because we end up in a state of nature. But suppose, suppose I propose a principle that just advantages me a little bit enough so that I come out better than everybody else, but they still come out better than they would in the state of nature. Then they'll agree to it. This is obviously not satisfactory. There's no termination rule in the, so they bargain forever. Well, okay. Rawls knew that there were problems. I'll tell you another story. I published an article in the Journal of Philosophy showing that the first version of his argument, the justice as fairness argument, was wrong. I ran into Jack at an American Philosophical Association meeting. I knew him because in 1959-60 we had been colleagues together in the Harvard Philosophy Department. I was a young instructor, he was a visiting professor, which was before he returned to become a permanent professor in the department. So I, and, and in those days you had something called the smoker, an enormous room filled with philosophers, it's a, a frightening thought. <laughs> moving around smoking and bumping into each other and I bumped into Jack he said hello I said Jack I just published an article showing that justice as fairness is wrong and his face fell but I said I just read your new article uh, distributive justice and the change you made to the fundamental principles in that meets my objections and he, he brightened he said oh that's all right then and he walked off into the crowd <laughs> so he knew without my criticism that he needed to change it. And what happened then was the full Monty, the whole thing that you know from a theory of justice. Already in the essay called Distributive Justice, which was published in the later Laslett and Runciman collection, he had changed the difference principle in a way that we're now all familiar with. And here's the way it sounds in that new he says, we interpret the second principle to hold that these differences are just if and only if the greater expe expectations were the more advantaged when playing a part in the working of the whole social system improve the expectations of the least advantaged. That's the, that's the final principle. It improves the, the least advantaged representative man. I say man because if you read this book very carefully, there aren't any women in it, but that's, that, that's a matter of the history of when it was written. It's not important. I'm sure Jack thought there were women, he just forgot to mention them. <laughs> At any rate, now with this change, Jack then repeated his theory of, his, his theorem claim. And here it is, this is a little, I'll just read little bits because I don't want to spend too much time reading. He says, the choice of this conception of justice is the unique solution to the problem set by the original position. What these individuals will do is then derived by strictly deductive reasoning from these assumptions about their beliefs and interests, their situation and the options open to them. And then he goes on. We should strive for a kind of moral geometry with all the rigor which this name connotes. Now, he says, unhappily the reasoning I shall give will fall far short of this since it is highly intuitive throughout. Yet as it is essential to have in mind the ideal one would like to achieve. 
I don't think Jack ever gave up Rawls. Sorry, I'm, this is a formal lecture. I don't think Rawls ever gave up his hope and belief that he was proving a theorem. But in order to make the theorem valid, he had to introduce some changes. And now comes the famous veil of ignorance. If you've heard of nothing else in the theory of justice, you've heard of the veil of ignorance. This is a wonderful expository device. You know, in the law, judges are said to be dis disinterested. Not uninterested, disinterested. That is to say, they do not take account in their judgments of their own private interest. The veil of ignorance is a brilliant literary device to capture the notion of being disinterested. Rawls assumes that when these individuals go into their bargaining, they, a, a veil of ignorance is low, lowered on them. They forget who they are. They don't know whether they're male or female, old or young, rich or poor, smart or dumb, educated or uneducated. But not knowing any of those things, they do know the laws of economics, the laws of science, the laws of psychology. They don't, Rawls says, even know which particular generation they are in. They don't know what year they're in or what century they're in, but they know the laws of economics and the laws of psychology and the laws of sociology. The only problem with the veil of ignorance is that it achieves too much. The problem in the first version was that the people knew too much about themselves. They knew whether they were going, had a good or a bad chance of ending on top. Now, under the veil of ignorance, they know so little about themselves that they have no reason to bargain or, or debate anything because they don't know what they want. They don't know, since they don't know what they want, they know they're rationally self-interested, but they don't know what their desires are, and therefore they have no idea what, what to bargain for. So Rawls now gives them life plans. He says, they are all assumed to have life plans. A life plan, as the term suggests, is an organizing conception of where you're going in life whether you're young or middle-aged or old. Who doesn't have a life plan? Buddhist monks don't have a life plan. Great artists don't have a life plan. Young people tend not to have life plans, but we're going to assume that, they're, that they do. But they have a life plan, but they don't know what their life plan is. However, what they do know is that whatever their life plan is, there are certain things that they want, certain things that will serve their, that, that will serve their interests. And those things are, he says, primary goods. Now, what are these primary goods? You have to have something to, have to advance a life plan. And so there are certain goods which everybody needs, regardless of what his or her life plan is. And Rawls says, these are rights and liberties, opportunities and powers, income and wealth. There they are. Now, there's a problem. Can't possibly be a quarter of six already, can it? Yes. I have a lot more to say. <laughs> Good God, I better stop telling stories. <laughs> Because Rawls is really engaged in trying to prove a theorem in bargaining theory, these primary goods must be reduced to an index. So what these individuals want is an index of primary goods. And they have what in, bar in, in utility theory is called positive marginal utility for primary goods. That is to say, the more they have, they want more rather than less, how, no matter how much they have. And then Rawls moves on with his argument, with page after page of elaborations. The notion of an index of primary goods is fundamentally and irretrievably incoherent. It would be incoherent even if the primary goods were all goods bought and sold in the marketplace. 
But if the goods are such things as rights and liberties, opportunities and powers, not just income and wealth, there is no way that you can create an index of primary goods. Let me give you a very simple example. All of you are familiar with the consumer price index, which is used to say whether we're having inflation or not, and if so, how much. 2% inflation, 2.8% inflation, 3.4% inflation. Consumer price index is put out periodically by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, a bunch of really smart economists in Washington who are very clued up on all of these problems, but do it anyway. They assume that everybody has a market basket of goods, food, clothing, shelter, health care, and so forth. And they assume, therefore, and they assume that they can measure that. They go out and they go to stores all over the, the country and they see what things are selling for. Now, one of the goods is obviously housing. There's a problem with this. When you buy a house, the typical thing is to take a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. When I left Columbia University to go to the University of Massachusetts, my first wife and I bought a house in Northampton, and we got a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. A 30-year fixed rate mortgage, if you haven't yet started buying real estate, means that every month you pay exactly the same number of dollars for 30 years. Not adjusted for inflation, the same number of dollars. Shortly after we got to Northampton in 71, America experienced runaway double-digit inflation. The inflation was so bad that even the University of Massachusetts had to give us raises in an attempt to compensate <laughs> for the inflation. One of the central components of your budget is your housing. When I was young, it was a, a week's housing for a month's, a, a, week, a week's wages for a month's housing. Now it's more like two weeks' wages for a month's housing. But my housing costs never went up a dime because I had a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage. I was not experiencing double-digit inflation. I was experiencing much less. To take another example, when I was young, this will give you an idea of just how old I am. When I was young, steak was expensive and lobster was cheap. So at living in Boston, if I wanted to have a cheap meal, I would buy lobster. Now when I go to Whole Foods, the steak is cheap and the lobster you have to take them out a mortgage loan for. <laughs> now, okay, so prices change, but suppose you're a vegetarian, or suppose you don't eat meat. Then for you, the drop in the price of meat is, is, is no help at all, but the soaring price of fish means that you are experiencing greater inflation than the people around you who eat meat. Some very smart economists have spent a lot of time trying to deal with this problem of index numbers. I will just tell you, since I don't have any time left, they didn't solve the problem. It is insoluble. All right. But let's leave, leave that aside. So Rawls has his revised principles. He has his veil of ignorance. He has his life plans. He has his index of primary goods. And now he says, how, is, how are these people going to choose? Now, the first thing that happens, it, you may have, this may have occurred to you. It did occur to Rawls. He says this in the book. Since they are all rationally self-interested and they don't know anything about themselves, they all reason exactly the same way. It's no longer a bargain, bargaining situation. Anything that's a good reason for one of them must be a good and equally good reason for all of them because the only thing that could differentiate would be some situation of their own per personal, some fact of their own personal situation, and they don't know who they are. Therefore, you can forget about a group of people getting together and bargaining. One person would do the whole job. One person under the veil of ignorance is as good as a hundred million people under the veil of ignorance. Okay? How is this person going to choose? And now Rawls introduces Maximin. If you've read the book, you know the word Maximin. Maximin is a term from game theory invented by John von Neumann. It's like zero-sum game and prisoner's dilemma, terms that are 
floated about in educated circles by people who haven't a clue what they mean. <laughs> I, I have heard the term zero-sum game used countless times on television. I've heard the term prisoner's dilemma used or read it in countless articles and countless discussions, always by people who have no idea what they're talking about. It's quite astonishing. So what I'm now going to do, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to do this even if it takes a little time, I'm going to explain this to you. I'm going to explain it to you for three reasons. First, because Rawls uses it. Second, because I have to do this to show you that he's wrong. And third, because at 85, I'm an unreconstructed, unreconstructed nerd, and I like this stuff. So I'm going to talk about it, OK? Here we go. In order to understand this, suppose we have a two-person game. Now, what I've done is to invent the simplest game I can possibly think of, which is pick up sticks with four sticks and two people. The game works like this, that players take turns alternately, and the turn consists of picking up one stick or two sticks, and the last person to pick up a stick loses the game. Okay? Now, if you are at all sharp, it'll occur to you instantaneously that the person who goes second has a forced win. If the first person takes one, take two. There's one left for the second person. If the person who goes first takes two, take one. There's one left for the, la for the, for the first person. Not an interesting game, but let us suppose nonetheless that there are three people sitting in the staff cafeteria of a hospital, and two of them are going to play this game. The three people are a trauma surgeon, <laughs> A, a heart surgeon, a trauma nurse, and a plastic surgeon. The trauma surgeon, the, the heart surgeon and the trauma nurse are playing. The plastic surgeon is watching. They decide that the trauma nurse will go first. So it's his turn now. But just as they're about to begin, the heart surgeon's beeper goes off. There's a patient in heart uh, failure, and she has to rush off. So she says to the plastic surgeon, play for me, will you? He says, oh, no. I know how important this is to you. You got to tell me. And she says, just to do what you think is best. And he says, no. You have to tell me every single thing that you would do, no matter what comes up. In every possible situation that can arise, I want you to specify what I'm to do for you. That's called a strategy in game theory, a complete specification of every move under any possible set of circumstances defined by the rules. So she does that, and they're about to start when the, when the emergency room nurse's beeper goes off. And he's called to an emergency. So he says to the, to the plastics, plastic surgeons never have emergencies, so there's no problem there. He says to the plastic surgeon, play for me. He says, no, no, I want to know exactly. So he, now, he gives him a strategy, and when he gives him his strategy and she gives him her strategy, now he can play the game for them because he is simply following what they have specified they would do in every possible situation. Okay? That's the situation. Now, you can represent this game by what's called a game tree. Here is the game tree for this game. Circles indi in indicate somebody's move. A hollow circle is A's move, and a filled in circle is B's move. A goes first, and he can either take one or two. B goes second. They keep going. These are all the possible outcomes of the game. A filled in box shows that B won. A hollow box shows that A won, OK? That is, that is the, nor the, the extended form of a game. And in any finite game with a finite termination rule, you can represent the game in this way, the two-person game. Now, how many strategies does each player have? Well, you can work that out. Here is a list of the strategies 
in listing the strategies, you don't have to list what happens when somebody has a forced move. So A's first strategy is take one. If B takes one, take one. You don't have to say what to do if B takes two because that's a forced move. That's a strategy. A's second strategy is take one. If B takes one, take two. Okay, that ends the game. His third strategy is take two. After that, whether B takes one and he's forced to take one and lose, or B, schmuck of the is, takes two and loses, that's, the, so A has three strategies. B has four strategies. B's first strategy is if A takes one, take one. If A takes two, take one. That's a strategy. His st second strategy is if A takes one, take one. If A takes two, take two. His third strategy is, if A takes one, take two. If A takes two, take one. And his fourth strategy is, if A takes one, take two. If A takes two, take two. So A has three strategies, and B has four strategies. Now, you can represent these strategies in a list like this, or if you want to summarize the whole game, you can create a matrix a matrix of rows and columns showing what happens when A's strategies are played against B's strategies. That's what's called an outcome matrix. And here you have the outcome matrix for this game. The three rows are A's three strategies. Strategy one, strategy two, strategy three. The four columns are B's strategies, B1, B2, B3, B4. The outcome is the result of the intersection of these two strategies. Trust, I, I spent a lot of time on this to make sure I didn't screw up because it's going on YouTube and you know if I made a mistake, some, I'll hear from it. I'll hear from somebody in India who will say, I was looking at your, and I, I'm afraid you have A3, B2 wrong. So these are the 12 possible outcomes. Okay? This is the outcome strategy. That's not the end of the story, however, because you do not have a right to assume that A and B both want to win you only have a right to assume that they are consistent in their desires. To show you what I mean, I will tell you another little story. I have a charming, very smart, delightful granddaughter named Athena, who is now 10 years old. She is also ferociously competitive. When Athena was three, I went to San Francisco to see her and her brother, and she wanted me to play Shoots and Ladders with her, which is a board game for kids. Shoots and Ladders has no strategy. You just turn cards and do whatever the cards tell you to do. It was very important to Athena to win the game. And since I am a doting grandfather, it was very important to me that Athena win the game. And since there's no such thing as choosing a bad strategy in Shoots and Ladders, I did the only thing I could. I cheated. <laughs> I peeked at the cards, and if a card came up that was good for me, I would put it at the bottom of the pack and take another one which wasn't so good for me. Okay. Now, assuming that A and B want to win, we can transform the outcome matrix into a payoff matrix. And if we give one for a win and zero for a loss, since we're assuming that both of them want to win, the numbers are arbitrary. We could choose 7.2 and minus 37 and a half, but it doesn't matter. One and zero is easy to follow. This is, an, a nat, a, the, this is the normal form of the game in a, pay, a payoff matrix, okay? Now then, now that you know all of that, Von Neumann says, Von Neumann is talking about the general case where there are M pure strategies for A and N pure strategies for B, 
So you have an M by N matrix. And in the special case in which A and B have strictly opposed preference orders. Strictly opposed preference orders means that if A prefers P to Q and Q to P to Q, well, strictly speaking, I might as well put it right. If A prefers P to Q or is indifferent between them, then B will prefer Q to P or be indifferent between them. They have exactly opposed preferences. Okay? In that case, von Neumann says, the rational thing for each player to do is to look at each one of his or her strategies look along a row, a row or look down a column and find for each strategy the worst thing that can happen to you. That, he says, is your security level. That's the worst you can get using that strategy. It's the minimum you can get using that strategy. Then, he says, choose the strategy that has the highest security level, the maximum minimum, the maximin. That's what maximin means. It's the, it's the decision procedure of choosing the strategy that has the maximum security level, the maximum minimum outcome. Only when you have a zero, what's called a zero-sum game, which I, I don't have time to explain to you what a zero-sum game is, but it's interesting. You can find it on my blog if you're really interested. Only in the case where you have a zero-sum game do you get interesting mathematical results. But that's what it means to choose maximin as your decision procedure. Now remember, in Rawls's argument, the game aspect of it has disappeared. It's no longer two or many people playing against one another. It's one person making a decision under the veil of ignorance. And Rawls says that in the special circumstances of the veil of ignorance, the rational thing for that person to do is to choose a set of principles according to the maximin principle. Now, Rawls's invocation of maximin makes no sense at all because with only one player there is no such thing as maximin. But he was, he was obviously intrigued by the term as everybody is. But he actually offered a justification and that justification is the crucial thing that I want to point to. He says, the person choosing has a conception of the good such that he cares very little, if anything, for what he might gain above the minimum stipend that he can, in fact, be sure of, of by following the maximin rule. Let me read you that again. That's his argument for choosing the difference principle. The person choosing has a conception of the good such that he cares very little, if anything, for what he might gain above the minimum stipend that he can, in fact, be sure of by following the maximin rule. Leave aside the term maximin. I was trying to figure out what was the situation that Rawls thought existed in this choice situation. Now look, Now's when I actually get to use chalk on a board, which I haven't done in many years. Never reported to them. Whoop. What? You recorded. So you drop this. That's just my that's just my glasses. I this think you're is, still all right. I'm still I'm still wired. Yeah. Okay. Let's suppose we decide to graph primary goods against the utility, an index of primary goods against the utility, okay? And here we put, we measure the primary goods. It doesn't matter how much verbiage Rawls uses. If you can't graph prime, an index of primary goods, it's not a real index. And here, that's the utility, okay? Now, we know, we know 
that, ev that this individual has positive marginal utility for primary goods, which means that the graph has got to go up and to the right, and it has, but there are lots of ways in which it could go up to the right. It could go like this. 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 So long as it doesn't ever dip down again as you get further to the right. Any one of those. But Rawls says, he describes the situation in the following way. Remember, he says, he has a conception of the good such that he cares very little, if anything, for what he might gain above the maximum, the minimum stipend that he can, in fact, be sure of, of by following the maximum. And then he goes on to say, and I'm afraid I don't have this. He goes on to say that the individual faces very serious consequences if he loses some of the primary goods, but it doesn't matter much to him if he gains some. And I thought, what possible shape could this curve have that would describe that, and where on the curve do you have to be? And the answer is... this. Index of primary goods here, utility of the index there. The curve has to look like this. Why? Because there are very dangerous consequences, and you have to be at the inflection point, or just to the right of it. Why? Because if you lose even a little bit of primary goods, you suffer a tremendous drop in utility. Whereas if you gain even a lot of primary goods, you gain only a little bit in utility. That's the only shape that fits the description that Rawls gives. There is, of course, no reason at all to suppose that that's the point that people are on. I'll tell you a story. Many, many years ago, I started to go to South Africa, and I went for 40, 40 times or more in 25 years, running a scholarship organization that I started for uh, black students in South Africa who were going to historically black universities. And when I visited the University of the Transkei in Umtata, I was told about a young man whose parents had sold their stock in order to send him to the university. I was so dim-witted that I thought they'd sold their shares in, <laughs> in, in General Motors. What they meant was they had, he had, they had sold their cattle. And by selling their cattle, they had sold themselves into desperate poverty in order to give one person in their family a chance of getting a, a degree that would, if he got it, make all of their lives better. They were located someplace like this, where there was an enormous lot. Uh, there's an enormous amount to be lost if they if they moved this way, but an enormous amount to be gained if they moved this way. Okay. And I thought, who is it who lives? at that spot. And then I had what I am perfectly willing to agree was a malicious thought. <laughs> and I will end with that malicious thought. I thought, who is it whose life is such that if he loses even a little bit of this index of primary goods, his life falls off the edge? But if he gets even a lot more of the primary goods, his life is only a little bit better. And I thought, a young tenured professor at Harvard, if he loses even a little bit of primary goods, he loses tenure and he might end up teaching God help him at a state university, or even worse, at a community college. Whereas if he has and keeps his tenure, even if he gets to be a university professor, he still has his summer home, he has his nice job, and the extra money he gets doesn't make his life that much better. 
But of course, not all of us in the original position under the veil of ignorance are professors at Harvard. And there is no reason for Rawls to assume that that is where it is. That is where the bargainer is. My conclusion is, and I'm serious about this, Rawls's idea was a brilliant idea. It genuinely was, and it didn't work. And he tried to change it. He made a series of ad hoc adjustments in it, the veil of ignorance, the, the life plans, the index of primary goods. And even with all of that, the argument just didn't bear out. Now, that ends my talk. I had more to say about this so-called inequality surplus which, on which the whole thing is based. But I think I will stop there, and maybe in the discussion we can go in that direction. So with that, I thank you.